What's up? It's your boy Joel Ortiz, and I want y'all to keep it locked right here because y'all watching the real Gully TV. It's official. This ain't no phony business right here. This is Gully TV. You keep it right here. Yeah. Hey, yo, it's TCPWTK, the fly. You're now tuning in right now to Gully TV. Peace. This is your boy, Noah the Flood. And right now, I'm rocking with Gully TV. Hey, yo, it's Rob, like, get Rob, man. Look, it's the claw. I'm rocking with Gully TV. What it is, it's SKYCOO Sky Zoo, live out the borough. And you are now watching. These niggas better pay attention. Gully TV. Or get found somewhere. When you watching Gully TV, I have a very special guest down here in the Dirty South. He needs no introduction, but I'll have him introduce himself. Homie. Yo, it's the one and only Sleepy Brown. Uh, one half of organized noise. First generation Dungeon family. The beginning, the middle, and the end. <laughs> Give me some history on the name. How do you come up with the name Sleepy Brown? Um, it was kind of like a couple of things, to tell you the truth. Uh, one was the story that uh, I was a big fan of Big Daddy Kane. And uh, I always thought he looked super cool. So, in a weird way, I came up with Sleepy from that. Then, uh, of course, at one time, uh, I lost my glasses at the dungeon. And, uh, I, you know, my eyes were down there closed because I couldn't see shit. <laughs> so, okay. uh, it was smoking a lot, it's another thing, you know. So, it's kind of everything, you know. The nickname came from just, you know, trying to be the coolest. No doubt. You know what I thought was um, as dynamic for you as the, the actual sound, your image? Who came up with your image? Um, I looked at, you know, prior to coming here, I looked at some of the videos from back in the day, and you was really putting that, that vintage shit on from back in the day. Yeah, and, that's, uh, that's, that's what it did was. Did you have a stylist, or you just was coming Well, yeah, yeah, I definitely had a stylist team, uh, Renee and, uh, and uh, Jalene sisters they definitely had me fresh but uh it was mainly the style that I, i'm doing basically is the 70s crooners so okay. i always wanted to kind of bring back because that that style of uh of male artist then was very manly okay super manly super in your face just straight black you know what i mean it black, was just right sexy and everything about it was just strong so i always try to uh do that, you know. So that's kind of what happened. Early on, did you um, did you was there a stereotype in regards to drawing inspiration from someone from the old school? Man, it was Marvin, uh, Barry White, uh, Curtis Mayfield, Isaac Hayes, of course. Uh, every crewman from the seventies, basically, right. or every um, basically style, because. That's kind of how we shot Can't Wait. Can't Wait ended up being, to me, like a black exploitation of his time. You know what I mean? Like a, a new kind of um, whole thing of, you know, being sexy, kind of thieves. Right. Ocean Eleven kind of kind of right. thing. You know what I mean? So all my inspirations come from the 70s. I grew up, you know, as a kid growing up, and, you know, you know, growing up backstage with my dad, seeing everybody um, definitely um, stayed with me. Music, of course, is in your pedigree. Your father was a performer. Mm -hmm. What was the name of the group in the song that he um, was particularly known for? Um, my dad, Jimmy Brown, in a uh, band called Brick in the 70s that uh, had um, multiple hits, man. Uh, first really big hit for them was Daz, which uh, people might know that it, uh, Cube sampled it for No Vaseline. Um, they had songs sample, everywhere put it in your mouth was a sample from Brick. Um, uh, Kid and Play, you know, it, it, that and dang, you know what I'm saying? Right. So, you know, I grew up, you know, when I was like, like six or seven, like, you know what I'm saying? I went to my really first concert and I used my dad and I'm seeing him rocking the shit out of his place. And I'm like, holy shit, like, hey, what? You know what I mean? So for me, that was just such a big inspiration. I knew what I wanted to do from that day forward. I know I wanted to do music, I wanted to be just like him. So Kid and Play song, Ain't Gonna Hurt Nobody, mm -hmm. that was a, a sample from your father's record? Yep, the hook too. Ain't gonna hurt nobody, the whole thing. So what was you at when the movie came out? When what, uh, House Party? Yeah. Oh, I was, I was, uh, what did that come out? 
Probably like mid eighties, something like something that. Something like that. Yeah. yeah, I was. I mean, I tell you, I I used to love when certain artists would like sample my dad and them. Like my favorite one, still to this day, no Vaseline. Q killed that shit. So right. That's my favorite one of all time. But I used to love to hear when you know Danny Dane used it. Everybody used it. It was just. It, I, I felt like so you was you your knowledge of music had you where you was understanding what a, what a sample was at a young age. But not at first, you know. Ray from Organized Noise really taught me, and this is the truth, because I when I first started producing, I was more of a R and B kind of you know just musical, very musical producer. And when I met Ray, Ray just had a bag, an old man bag full of samples of, of stuff that he picked up off tapes and, and uh, James Brown. He really introduced me to the whole James Brown sample, you know what I mean? Because okay. I didn't know. I thought, you know, most of the, most of the groups were kind of doing it because I just didn't know. But uh, yeah, he taught me the whole sample craze, you know what I mean? So once I learned that, you know, that's when I started really appreciating, you know, when they were sampling my dad now. No doubt. The way that I received you, um, you was kind of like the, the Nate Dog of the South. I've been calling it a lot, yeah. Nate Dog of the South. Mm -hmm. um, was it your intention to keep your sound and the projects that you worked on centralized down here in the South? Because I know that I looked at a bunch of records. I think um, Pharrell was probably someone who wasn't from around here. But right. basically, you put all your work in right here. Yeah, because, you know, Organized Noise, man, we were such a close. A click, man. Like we, when we first started working, we wouldn't let nobody in. So you know, everything was in house. You know what I mean? So that sound just kind of, you know, I wanted to keep the sound that I put on it. I wanted to make that the sound of Outkast, the sound of Atlanta. So I always, you know, kept it in around. You know, so what you mean? ain't want that dope sold nowhere else. No, nah, I ain't want to sell dope nowhere. Else. <laughs> I wanted to sell it right in the A because they bought it all. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> yeah, top shit. So plus, you know, our whole thing, man, was. When we first doing Outkast's first album, we listened to Chronic, we listened to everybody, you know what I'm saying? Because we felt like, all right, well, we come into this game, these are our heroes, but man, we got to be right there with them. We got to come in the door where they turn around and look at us. So we wanted to make sure Atlanta had a, a, not just a look, but a sound. You know, we had Jermaine, we had Dallas, and they definitely represented Atlanta, but at the same time, Jermaine was kind of doing New York sound, LA sounds, you know what I'm saying? So for us, we wanted to, you know, be able to call out our spots because I remember going to a concert and seeing uh, DJ Quick. And DJ Quick had everybody screaming Compton. And I was sitting there like, wow, that's amazing, you know what I'm saying? Everybody had <laughs> Compton, you know what I'm saying? So I wanted to do that, you know what I mean? So, we did, you know, that was our main focus to be like, all right, so we're going to let them know. We're not to go with them now. We're gonna let them know what we are from East Point Carter Park. We're gonna let them know being here. We're gonna, you know what I'm saying? To right. give you a picture, a movie that goes with the music. And your prime, right? When we started to actually see you in magazines and in videos and stuff like that, did you actually have to shut the door on people who pursued you musically to work on their projects? Um, I never shut down anything. It was more of like my management team that would do that, you know, that I had at the time. They, uh, Cause you know, for me, I wanted to work with everybody. You know what I mean? It's certain stuff that I wouldn't do because, you know, I'm a weird old bro with that Aquarius thing. And music, musically, we are weird. You know what I mean? So sometimes it might be the right song, but we just don't hear it. So you know, I've, I've always, you know, I mean, it might have been a couple of times where we, where I had to be like, nah, I can't do that, or you know, something else was going on at the time and I couldn't get to it. Something like that. Did they understand that? Did they understand your reasoning behind, I can't touch that project, did they understand it? Probably not. You know, I probably got called everything on the sun, but you know, <laughs> that's what it is. You know? right. I don't want to give you nothing that I don't feel like it's going to be that thing, you know. That's the thing with Outkast, we make sure that whatever we did is going to be fun, you know. What was the first reputable record that you all Repeatable record? Yeah. Which, um, what, what, what was the first hot one? Uh well, when I when I say hi, I mean I look I went and did my research. 
you had a lot of songs that was on BET. You was on songs that was on BET. Yeah, like yeah. Which, sure. which one of those was your first? Mm, well, first was with Cass. Uh, the, when everybody started recognizing who I was, and they started putting the name with the face, uh, was so fresh, so plain. Because that was the first time I really been, like, really stepped out and was, like, in front of the camera. Everything else was just on the album, you know what I mean? First Outcast album. Because Players Ball was actually the first repeat, you know what I mean? They were, they were playing that, but when everybody started knowing me <clears throat> or seeing me, that was basically so fresh. singing the hook on, on Players Ball? Yeah. Oh, the place. Yeah. That was the first one. That was the that was that was the first one. The funny thing is we were in the studio and Rico um the song was playing and we used to love this break because we wanted to sample it and then we used to say um it was the play of the ball it was like uh, outside all the hustles were there, blah 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 blah. Yeah. So Rico just went in there and started saying it and when he said it, it just clicked. I'm like, all the players came, that's it. But we wanted we wanted to keep it on a uh, Curtis Mayfield vibe. I was about to say that. I thought that that was like a sample from Curtis Mayfield mm -hmm. or Donnie Hathaway or somebody like that. No, no, but no, you no. really went and captured that 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 sound from back there. It was it like was a crazy, time capsule. What was crazy is uh, after that, I remember we did because we did uh, two songs on a uh, Curtis Mayfield album before he passed. So I got a chance to work with him. Oh, wow, that's crazy. And when we were in the studio, I was nervous because um, I didn't know if he heard play the ball yet. So we sitting in them, and they bring him in. And the first thing he said was like, Sleepy, like, I really like what you're doing. I really like that play the ball. And I was blown away. <laughs> I was like, whoa, Curtis Mayfield just gave me the green light. So that was awesome, you know what I mean? So. Um, with that song, we wanted to capture that feeling of, you know, a player's ball, a 70s feel. Right. But with that today thing on it. Did you ever go, like, play with old Curtis Mayfield songs in your private time just to see if you could blow them? Could you yeah, I've, I've done um, a couple of other songs with Curtis. Uh, well, not with Curtis, but with Curtis Mayfield. So I, like, one of the songs that we did for Outkast was, uh, which was a Curtis record that he produced on um, the, the five the five. Step steps or something like that. Something mm -hmm. like that. But uh, it was two dope boys. Ooh, we, ooh. That was a Curtis sound. Wow. Yeah, that was Curtis. So, and then, you know, Curtis loved it so much that it was really kind of easy to clear shit with him. Right. You know I mean, you know, go ahead, you know, because we basically, at one time, uh, when he had his studio, we basically moved in and um, made his, uh, took the offices over and kind of made our first little um, organized noise office. So we got we got great history with Curtis. We love him. Damn. Take me back to the uh, the making of the So Fashion So Clean music video. Was that your first encounter with 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 the pimps, the famous players, and all of that? With who not with? With the pimp, with the, with the famous players and shit. Oh no, I've been on. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, but you know that that video was uh, that was a lot of fun because you know I was excited because I was going to finally. Um, kind of, you know, step, step up and, and, and be in the video and, you know, everybody see who's singing it, so. Um, that was really cool. What's funny about this song, man, when we we did the very first BET Awards in Las Vegas, the first one, and we closed it out with So Fresh, So Clean. We had, uh, we had all the pimps with us. We had Magic Don one. <laughs> we had everybody. <laughs> We had all of them, bro. They were on stage with us and we did the song. I'll never forget that. It was funny. It was the first BET Awards, the very first one in Las Vegas. It was crazy. What would you say is your signature record? The Way You Move. The Way You Move. My, my favorite record I've produced, though, um, is on Joy. It's a song called Lick. Still one of my favorite songs. That song is so fucking nasty and dirty. It's like a bass and some syrup, bro. I don't know what the fuck I was on that day. Did you do that the, motherfucker turns out right? <laughs> did you do the writing? Most of the lyrics that you did whenever you were singing, did you do do the actual writing? Yeah, um, the story about the way he moved. Um, I was at Big Boy House at a little cookout he was having, and I was up in the Boom Boom Room, and that's when he used to have a, a, a CD changer that um, would hold like two hundred CDs. So it was just playing. Right. So I'm sitting in there and then all of a sudden that beat came on, but it was just the skeleton of it, so it wasn't the full beat. 
And I just, I kept hearing it. And then all of a sudden I just heard the hook. I like the way you move. And I ran down the beat and I was like, bro, I don't know what that song you playing right now. I said, bro, that motherfucker, I got a hook for it. That's crazy. And he was like, he listened, he was like, damn, that's Carl Mo. And it, was, it ended up being a producer that, um, I kind of took under my wing when he was younger, called Carl Mo. Uh, and, um, yeah, it turned out right, man. We uh <laughs> we went in that night and uh, laid the hook and then everything, you know, it just kinda jumped off. It's like it's like Rico wrote the lyrics to um So Fresh So Plain. I gave him the melody. But he more cause I, I love um, how Rico Rico's a worse man. He's he, you know, get the gas, so I knew he would come up with something fly. So organized noise is a production team. Yeah, it's Rico Rico Wade, Ray Murray, and myself. So your skill set the singing, the harmon harmonizing, that all come from having a producer's ear? Uh, yeah, and you know, getting it from my dad, man. Like, my dad played by ear, taught himself how to play horns. And, you know, I'm kind of the same way. Um, I just learned everything. Just, you know, my, my, grandma, my grandmother, his mother, right. uh, taught me how to play uh, organ when I was little. Did your dad get a chance to hear you with Sleepy Brown? Oh yeah, my dad's super proud. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, he bragged about me all the time. That's what's up. Yeah. That's what's up. Um, the the new the new generation of Atlanta rappers, what's your what's your relationship like with some of the new guys? Haven't really met a lot of new guys. I haven't met Lil Baby, haven't really met anybody, but you know, uh, as far as like you know, respect wise, you know, I know it's there and I have respect for them. Um, any artist coming out of Atlanta, I love it because, you know, it's still moving and, you know, um, that's a beautiful thing because that's all we ever wanted for Atlanta. We wanted Atlanta to have a voice and stand up and, you know, you got to come to Atlanta to break a record. You know what I mean? So, I love the fact, man, that, um, you know, all these young cats out here, you know what I'm saying? My favorite, though, is Thug. I love, you know, Thug. I think, uh, he, he's sort of he's sort of a genius when it, when it, what he's doing, man. He's uh, he's killing it. Word. Tell me what you think about the versus competition. Oh, who the ox? Just, Just the, the, the concept of the because I'm I'm hearing, no, um, I'm, hearing thing, I'm hearing y'all name a lot. Oh yeah, I heard that too. Uh, they want to do a Dodgers family against Wu Tang. <laughs> I'm tell you the funny story too. We actually were supposed to do an album together with the Wu. It was going to be, uh, uh, what are we going to name it? Um, is it going to be North versus South or something like that? But the way we were going to do it was Organized Noah was going to produce Wu Tang and RZA was going to do Dungeon Family. Okay. You know what I'm saying? I so think it was going to really just flip it, and, you know, but it never really happened or took off or anything. So to hear the verses, man, I mean, I, I'm going to say this. I would love to do it, but only if 3,000 gonna be there. Right. I don't wanna do it without him. Cause then it's authentic, it's there, cause they all gonna be there. You know what I'm saying? We did, me and Big just did a show with them um, in Denver at Red Rock. They did, uh, they had a symphony, it was so cold. They had a symphony with, uh, I think they bought the rights to uh, the Wu-Tang movie, the old couple movie. Right. So they did a live, um, like a live, uh, fuck. Um, score. Okay. They did a live score. So they had the orchestra back there, they played the movie, and then they come in with their songs, you know what I'm saying? So we were, you know, I've, I've seen all of them. They were all there. So I'm with it, but only if three would be there. That's the only way I think it would just be incredible. Why is it a question on whether or not he participates? He introverted. Three, three don't mm -hmm. really want to, you know, which I understand, three don't want to perform no more, man. He, he's on a whole other thing. I'm, I mean, understand, he loves hip hop. He, he he definitely still writing. He'll do verses and stuff, but he he ain't with that. You know what I'm saying? Like, we work Dre. That was him, him, and, him and Big were like 17. You know what I'm saying? So he's been working. And then, you know, over time, man, you, you've done so much and you've been everywhere. And like, you know, that man just, you know, he's just on the whole other thing. I love him. I don't give a fuck. He, he ain't never got a rap for me. You know what I'm saying? I don't care. You know what I'm saying? That's my boy. So it's whatever he want to do. The first, the early albums, y'all did all the production yourself, Organized Noise? Yeah, we did uh, some playlist, we did that, and then um, 
when it came to, uh, then we did Goody Mob Society, so then when it came to um, Outkast's next album, that's when Big and Drake started getting into production themselves. So we would produce it with them, you know what I mean? Right. Uh, they would bring us the track, then we'll add stuff, finish it, do it like this, and then um, uh, equipment is when they really kind of stepped out um, to become a full producer, you know what I mean? Um, so, you know, we, we, we definitely produce a lot of the first albums on everybody. You had some input on Ain't No Thing But A Chicken Wing? Really, that was big, man, big, big. Uh, came up with that hook. We were, uh, me and him had just walked into the studio and Ray played that beat and we all went nuts. And yeah, that's the shit. was just like, ain't no thing but <laughs> chicken wine. I did it with him, you know what I mean? But yeah. I'm, I'm not gonna take credit, but that's all big. No doubt. God damn, man. Uh, 2021, you still actively producing? Mm -hmm. We are uh, less. A uh, little hit we had, man, was with uh, Janelle Monet. I like that, we did that song. We, uh, we've done songs with Aria, uh, Aria Lennox. We got songs on, um, who else? Uh, we work with a lot of people, bro. Uh, so we got beats coming out. Um, new music and everything, we still working. Y'all always had, a, had an R&B um, situation going? Y'all always was putting out, pushing R&B records too? Um, not at first. I mean, we started out like that as a production team, but, um, you know, Outkast took off first, so all of the R&B that we used to do didn't really come out until, like, Society of Soul and TLC did some stuff for them and all that kind of stuff. All right. You know what I'm saying? So, um, but, you know, it's funny. I was just talking to Ray the other day, and I was like, yeah, man, we're doing a lot of R&B. We need to go holler at some of these young boys and get some beats on them. You know what I'm saying? So I think that's our next move. You know. How can from how can somebody approach you? Will you work with a guy that you would count on social media and shit like that? Um, I gotta hear stuff, man. And, you know what I'm saying? I have to see, you know, if you really work it. Like, you know what I'm saying? How many followers you got? Let me hear some Spotify. Let me just let me hear what you're doing. Let me hear with some SoundCloud stuff. Let me hear what you're doing. And let me make that decision, you know. So I just can't say, excuse me, when, when uh, somebody hit me right. in a DM, I'm like, I don't work with you. I just can't be like, okay, cool, let's do it. You know what I'm saying? I don't know, you know what I mean? It's got to be special. So um, I just got to let you know, got to lay the plan out for me. Let me see what you're doing, what, what you're doing, what you're going to do, what's this, what, you know. Let me see what you're doing, and then I'll make decisions. When yeah. Outcast was in that prime. It was about being, I don't know, being a player and being fly down here in Atlanta. As of late, it's dangerous down here. What you think about the transition? Do you think that came with the style of music that started being produced? Um, I can't say if it's just, you know, if it's just the music, it's everything, man. It's just the environment. Everything just kind of changed, you know. Uh, the new generation had a whole nother you know, thought, you know, the way he want to do things. So, you know, things change, man. It, you know, it'll get worse before it get better. But, um, you know, I can't say, you know, gangster music made everybody in Atlanta get gangster. Because <laughs> that's bullshit, you know? Right. You know, I know music can definitely change your mood. Music is like, you can get in your car and listen to some gospel and be all happy the next thing you know. Some twerk record come on and you get nasty twerking while you driving and next thing you know there's another record make you mad because it's you know about heartbreak so now you're pissed right. off and you know what I'm saying but it ain't gonna make you really go and react on it you know right. what I'm saying it'll put you in a certain mood but you're not gonna go and just go nuts you know so how do you feel about radio today what I, what I, how do you feel about Atlanta radio today the records that they're playing uh. I gotta say I like it because, you know, we got a lot of stations and we are running music, you know, and that's that's really a beautiful thing. Do I get tired of a lot of stuff? Yes, I do. Do I listen to radio a lot? No, not a lot. But, you know, I can't appreciate it because I remember when we ain't really had it, you know, we had like two or three stations and, you know, yeah, you know, it, it was what it was, but now we have got a lot of stuff, man, we on the move. Man, we right now in Atlanta, Georgia, and you tuned into Gully TV, keep it locked here. It's the gulliest, trust me. Smicky! Trust me. Peep game, you know what it is. It's SKYZOO, Sky Zoo, live up the borough. And you are now watching Gully TV. You know what I mean?
Everybody getting it in, man, one time. Peep game, you know what it is. It's SKYZOO, Sky Zoo, live up the borough. And you are now watching Gully TV. You know how they getting it in, man, one time.